Hello, everybody. Welcome back to this program about black Africans. So the question is, are black African people caused? Are black African people caused? <laughs> well, that's the question, a million dollar question. Are, are black people caused? Are Africans caused? Well, that's why I'm do coming to you with this program today, because I believe that, um, you know, we need understanding. Both black people themselves need understanding about this, and white people need understanding about this, and the rest of the world need understanding about this. So uh, today, the topic that I'm going to be treating is the first civilization of the world. Um, <clears throat> many people today thank Europe for what we have. The civilization that we have today <clears throat> is thanks to the Protestants, the early Protestants, and it's thanks to uh, the European civilization, you could say. So, which is really true. That is the truth. But apart from today, the European civilization also received something from other civilizations as well, including from the African civilization, especially the Ethiopian civilization. But when we talk about Ethiopian civilization, we are not talking about the country of Ethiopia. We are talking about black, black civilization, that is, all those countries under Egypt. So, uh, but before you could have what you have today, we should also know that we had to have something, we had something yesterday. If you don't have yesterday, you cannot have today. So what we have today in Europe is as a result of what we had yesterday in Africa. It's just like saying you said you have nine, but how can you have nine if you don't have one, if you don't have two, if you don't have three? So what all of us are enjoying today is a combination of what other people have passed over to us some time back. So today I want to talk about the first civilization. The uh, what the, the first civilization of the world is is uh, the Ethiopian or the black civilization. Ethiopia, the first civilization in the world. And um, so that's what we are going to be talking about today. And I, I'm afraid. So they might not be enough to finish this topic. I might need to uh, continue it tomorrow. But, um, but we have to start today first. That's no problem. <clears throat> so let us go into the teaching today. Let us move to the first civilization no issue, in the world created by Africans. The first civilization in the world created by Africans, to begin with, let us describe civilization itself. And I think that's what I should do today. I think I should I should start this topic. I think is this book normal? Net? Uh, grom cosveshe, nada grom grom cosveshe as she started nada menshe. In my opinion, I probably did that, but I did today. I probably pamosh. No, pamosh that is lish na, is lish na tam. Da, no puska I probably pamosh that. Te pada idi ya tebe goro. So well, I'm sorry, guys. So I'm just trying to fix the the sound because I I understand that the sound is not very good. What we have right now is not the best sound uh, on. So we are trying to fix the sound. <clears throat> I feel that the high, that the high something is too high and it's, 
is uh, is making a lot of noise. The I could hear some sound resounding coming from there. The way Samal Beru is there, like so. Um, and I don't know if you can hear me very well. Oh, Lucia Stella, I don't know if the sound is good enough right now. So anyway, <clears throat> yeah, I think it's good now. So, but let's change. Let's change the uh, title. I think I'm going to change the title of this particular one. I'm going to call it uh, "What is Civilization?" What is Civilization, Nazwane? What is Civilization, and how it is created? What is Civilization, and how it is created? Yeah, because I think I I need to spend some time explaining to you about the meaning of civilization and how we all come across or uh, come about civilization and what do we call civilization in the first place. So if we look at um, the African continent right now, we see that we cannot call it civilized. No, sorry, I'm not on my own. Problem has welcome. Uh, we cannot call it civilized. And the reason why we cannot call it civilized is because um, of underdevelopment. When there is lack of development, there is underdevelopment, there cannot be civilization. So that is uh, a problem that we have right now in, in Africa. And when people look at the Africa of today, they use that to um, determine Africans in general. And that's the problem because of the lack of civilization that is in Africa right now. We used, we think that it has always been like that, and that is who they are. And that's the danger in trying to use one story to determine and to brand a whole nation, a whole people. And um, that's what has been done. That is the narrative of the world in regards to Africans. Because everybody, every nation has gone through stages of you know, advancement and stages of stagnation and even uh, stages of uh, um, downfall. So what Africa is going through right now is a stage of downfall. And that stage, that downfall stage or that underdevelopment stage uh, is the reason why a lot of people despise Africa and Africans. But it has not always been like that because at the time when African countries and nations were advanced, the other nations were also in the stage of underdevelopment and backwardness. And, um, but the world used the advancement of Africa and Africans to create their own civilization. So the same thing today, we should also use the advancement and civilization of other continents and other parts of the earth to revive and create our new civilization. So, um, yeah, so what is civilization? Uh, what is civilization and how is it created? What is civilization and how is it created? Then maybe the next class, I will do Africa, uh, Ethiopia as the first civilization. But today I'm going to call it what is civilization and how it is it? Is it? Proverb. How is it created? How is it created? All right. So let us move to the to the to talk about what civilization is and how it is created. Uh, first of all, civilization is a form of culture. In its turn, culture is pattern behavior, which the individual learns either through instruction or imitation from, of course, the other culture members or from the other uh, people in that social group. So, first of all, civilization is a form of culture. But it is, civilization is not the same as culture. You have to understand that. Because culture is what gives birth to civilization. But civilization itself, 
uh, but, but culture itself does not automatically give back to give birth to civilization. So, for example, you could have a culture but be uncivilized, and that is what we have right now. If we are going to talk about majority of the African people and people groups in the African continent, we cannot say we are civilized right now. A lot of some are civilized, some are not, but most are not. So they have culture, but that does not transmit and translate to civilization. There are two things that are needed for a culture to become civilized. And um, we are going to be talking about that today. So, but let me just lay the foundation first. That all civilization, on the other hand, are connected to a culture. culture and every culture could become civilized and civilized culture. But not every culture is automatically civilized and not every culture automatically becomes civilized. So you might have a culture and tradition and remain uncivilized forever. And you might have uh, a culture that advances to civilization. Now, according to God's wisdom and God's order, the life and history of the world goes in circles. So if Africa is the cradle of civilization and the beginning of civilization, it is only natural that the, it's like a circle. The history of the world is going on in circle. So such that the first will eventually become last. And then not, as the history keeps on going, the last will eventually become first as well. So if, so if you are saying right now Africa is last, it means it gives us another day, let's say things, uh, echo. So uh, if it is last now, it means we would eventually become first. But because we are first, that's exactly the reason why we are last now. Uh, first will always become last eventually, and last will always become first. So, first of all, civilization is a form of culture. In this term, culture is patterned behavior. So what is culture? This is des describing or defining culture. Culture is a patterned pattern of behavior or patterned behavior uh, which a person learns by interacting with the other fellows or with the other citizens or members of that particular culture. And that pattern of behavior could be cultivated through instructions, through teachings, through upbringing, through parenting, and sometimes through in, 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 in initiation, in, 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 in initiation or, and of course through imitation from other members of that particular oh which is Pashlo Slava Bogulu Shestal. Or that part or that, that particular group. What dash law? Slava Bog. That means we probably I'm sorry guys. I can't get my So culture consists of all forms of human behavior, except those found among the apes or animals. So oh, no, I, I think that's the wrong way to say it. Culture consists of all forms of human behavior. The only thing we don't call culture are behaviors that uh, are behaviors that are, con are based on instincts and. <laughs> Instincts and uh, uh, what do you call it? Instincts and reflexes. So behaviors that are based on instincts and uh, reflexes, we cannot call those things culture. So which means that uh, the main instincts of man, they are animalistic. And what are these main instincts? Survival instinct and reproductive instinct. So you don't regard to reproductive instinct as part of the culture. That is not culture. And then you don't call 
reflexes, things that people do by ref, reflex, ref, reflexes, or through by through um, what do you call it, stimulation. You don't call those things. Uh, you don't call them culture. So let me tell you the two, the main things you don't call culture. You don't call instincts culture. For example, the desire to want to reproduce, sex. Sex cannot be a culture. That, that's number one. Number two, the instinct to save yourself, the, uh, in, the survival instinct, you know, that people do, you know, because you are hungry, you want to eat. You don't call that culture. Uh, the fact that you want to protect yourself, you want to, you don't call that for, so things that are based on instinct are normally animalistic. And things that are based on, yeah, like a survival instinct and reproductive instinct. That is not part of culture. So all other things that people do, all forms of human behavior in a culture, okay, for example, that you want to go to the toilet, you know, you know you, you do all those things. You, you don't call those things culture, right? That is, those things are just instincts. They are based on instincts, they are based on stimulus and reflexes. So we don't call those things uh, culture. So what are culture then? Culture, therefore, is at all other human activities, human forms of behavior. Those, the, 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 uh, the subtotal of human behavior and interaction among men, their behavioral uh, patterns among one another is what we call culture. But, we, but instincts, are not culture because instincts, reflexes, and stimuli are not culture because these things are natural also to animals. So we have to distinguish and distinct and distance animalistic tendencies in man from their culture. If you are going to use the animalistic tendencies of man to define their culture, then it is easy to demonize people or to, to, um, yeah, to, to stereotype them. And to, okay, for example, if you go to Africa and you look at people that, because that is the way Europeans uh, viewed the Africans when they got to Africa the other time, I mean, the, you know, in the dark ages. They saw the way they were living and they were using their instincts to determine their humanity. And they were using their instincts to, de to determine their culture. And to de de so they will, use, they, you, they, they, they will say something like, these people are not human because they just want to have many wives all the time. They have many wives and they have many children. They just, so it means they're just having sex all the time. But there is a, an explanation for that. Because when there is no, when you are confined into a given environment and there are no light, no electricity, no civilization, activities are not into the dark. Once it becomes dark, the only thing you have to do is do for the children to go to sleep and for the adults to mate. So you could understand a lot of those things. But if you use that to now say that, they are, that is their culture, their culture is primitive, then you demolize them, then you stereotype them and you begin to say they are not humans or they are less human than yourself. So you don't use instinct to determine people's culture. So the same thing, you don't use uh, survival instinct. So because, for example, they see uh, maybe Africans come and see white people and then they begin to run or they begin to say, oh, you are like an... Uh, uh, a deity and they begin or they see you behave in a way that is strange to them they begin to idolize you as white men or things that are behave in funny ways because of the that is survival instinct because they are not used to this the, but this has been also in Europe if you look at the book of Acts of the Apostles you will see that Europeans also behave like that look for example when Paul and, uh, and Barnabas came to Ephesus in Greece and in Europe and Macedonia, they also wanted to worship them because those people were able to do something and perform an act that they were not used to. They were ready to worship them. This happens in all cultures. 
So you don't use the survival instincts of people or reproductive instincts of people or even st stimuli, things, actions that come from stimuli or from, um, yeah, from stimuli, from reflexes to determine people's culture. You have to be more holistic to determine people's culture. Well, that's about culture. Uh, <clears throat> but the reason I'm talking about this is because that mistake had been done, had been made with Africans and they are being regarded as animals or less than animals or just same as animal. So that's what I'm trying to say in this point. Culture consists of all forms of human behavior except those found among the apes. And what are those things found, uh, found among the apes? That the apes or animals can uh, they are they, what is they are normally uh, you know, they are guarded and they are you know, they, they live by instinct by stimuli and by reflexes so those we cannot use that to determine man or humanity we can use that to just determine you know the, the animal world which man included in that but it's not culture among the forms of behavior common to man. Uh, and ape and animals are the following. Impulses toward mating and parenthood, which is the same thing as reproductive uh, uh, impulses or instincts. Then in impulses to play, hunt, and explore is also common to man and animal. Then tendencies to imitate and show off, to attack when angry, and to take flight when frightened. And desire for companionship. So these are all survival instincts and impulses. Hence, the above are classified properly as non-cultural activities. So all these things are non-cultural activities, and you cannot use them uh, to determine a, a person's culture, okay? The forms, the forms of behavior specifically resisted to man or limited to man and which are truly cultural activities are growing crops, and that's why you don't see animals growing crops because you have to be intelligent to, to grow crops. So that is what the Europeans were supposed to use to determine the culture of Africans. But they were using the other list that I'd given earlier, making them to justify themselves why they are to enslave Africans, why they are to colonize Africa, because they are not human. But you are using a criteria that is common to all animals, including man and apes or an animal. But you are not using the criteria that is common to only man. Like, can these people grow crops? And Africans were growing crops on their own before they met Europeans. Domestication, domestication of animals. Can, uh, 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 were Africans domesticating animals? Of course, just like Europeans. Cooking. Were Africans cooking? Yes, they were. Weaving of clothes. Were Africans doing that? Yes. The, the use of their language. They have their own language? Yes. Which may be defined as the expression of definite ideas by means of the uh, larynx, lips, and tongue. Did Africans lip their, use their lips, lips and tongue and, uh, and, uh, and lungs? They did. So these are what constitutes people's cultural bases, people's cultural foundations. These are what will help inform us about people's cultures not instincts, not impulses, not stimuli, and not reflexes. In its turn, civilization is nothing more or less than literate culture. So now, let's, so we have defined to you what culture is and how we determine culture. So culture is, you know, the subtotal and of human activities, behaviors, and uh, patterns and interaction apart from those 
activities that are based on instinct, impulses, uh, and uh, reflexes and stimuli. Okay. And you saw the list. So, but how does a culture transcend just being a culture into civilization? How does a culture become what we call civilized? There are two factors that determine the civilization of a culture. The first thing that determines the civilization of a culture is that that culture has to have written um, criteria. The culture has to be able to uh, commit its communication and its culture into a written form, one way or the other. Now, in other cultures that are not civilized, there is also history and there is also language. There is culture. But they always pass those things down through oral rendition. And why is it that oral rendition is not totally regarded as civilized way of, of, you know, of uh, civilized culture? Because it's not reliable. And because men and their mind, the mind of man is not, hmm, it's not reliable. Any man could forget things that he had learned before. We could all forget. So no matter how many people have received that information, there is a tendency of it being faulty one way or the other that's one that's why islam is and quran cannot be reliable and cannot be seen as mm, a reliable document because it's based on narration oral narration but For a culture to be civilized, it has to get to a place where they can sub, uh, they can commit to writing their experiences and culture. So when a culture has graduated to a place where it could be committed to writing, and not just writing, but also documentation, then we are talking about a culture that is civilized. So there must be writing, which means there must be scholarship. With the, a culture must be able to produce scholars. And that's on one hand for it to be a civilized culture. But besides scholarship, a culture must also be able to produce scientists. So the combination of scholarship and science is what leads to civilization. But let's go ahead to my notes. In his turn, civilization is nothing more or less than literate culture. So it is when a culture is having literature, I mean, scholarship and science that we say that culture is advanced, that culture is civilized, is developed. Or we could say that culture has become literate. So a society is civilized only if it contains two things, scholars and scientists. The scholar consolidates and classifies, classifies the knowledge which has already been acquired by that culture. So through scholarship, the knowledge and the culture is retained and converted into knowledge, into, into uh, docu documents and is handed over to the hand of the scientists who in turn provides and proceed, proceeds to experiment and to you know use the knowledge base that and the documents that he has to experiment it to and what is what does science do science clarifies or it cross checks the information so science is supposed to receive the knowledge of that culture or the knowledge that is being passed down the line by the culture and through scientific method 
cross-check it that it could be verified. So when it is verifiable, we now know that that culture and that knowledge is, is, is reliable. For example, in my African, uh, in my, uh, I'm an African, so I come from a part of Nigeria that is called Yoruba. I mean, we have some knowledge of culture that is passed down throughout the ages of how Yoruba people came to be. And there are so many legends and so many uh, stories about this. One of the stories is that our uh, progenitor, Odudua, came down from heaven on a rope and landed on the, uh, uh, you know, in the, in the land of Ife, you know, that's a certain town there. And from there, you know, the whole earth was uh, populated. And um, another one says that the, the li life started in Ife, you know. So that is a body of knowledge right there. Maybe it was even committed to writing, but it was mostly oral. When it is oral, it's not very reliable. And because it's not reliable, that knowledge has to be passed, even when it is committed to writing now, to scholarship, has to now be passed to scientists. So any culture that does not produce scientists can never be civilized. Because that affirmation that our progenitor came down on a rope from heaven, <laughs> somebody has to verify. Now, as much as I'm a Yoruba person, and as much as I respect our culture but there is foolishness in some stories there that is not it cannot be regarded as truth and no yoruba person that is intellectually sound should be repeating those stories <laughs> because it's a legend so hey, what is the difference between a legend and historical fact and science so legends are stories that could not be verified by history by science, sorry. So, it might be commuted com 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 to writing, but it's just a legend if it cannot be verified scientifically. It's the same thing with Quran. I mean, I mean, Quran will tell you about the sun and about the earth. That you know, that all those a lot of uh, a lot of claims in Quran cannot be very. I mean, cannot be verified by science, and so they are documented. So they have scholarship, but they don't have science. So if science cannot affirm what scholarship, that's why the two, there can never be civilization without the existence of the two, of scholarship and science. So if scholarship only has all the facts written down, all the information passed down, and it's not affirmed and confirmed through scientific process and scientific method, those are just legends and they are just stories. So, but when you get a culture where uh, information and knowledge, body of knowledge is, con con uh, is, is documented, is through research and writing, is, that culture is literate because of you no know, scholarship. But for it to be civilized, those body of knowledge must now be verified through scientific methods that are reliable. And science must be able to affirm that yes, these are true. Then we could say that society is a civilized society because they are based on cause and effect. They are based on verified knowledge and their uh, actions and their culture and their belief systems are verifiable. So let's go, let's go back to my note. This color Okay. A society is civilized only if it contains scholar and scientists. The scholar consolidates and clarifies the knowledge which has already been acquired and hands it on to the scientist who thus provided proceeds to experiment. Thus, the increase of knowledge without the touch of learning the scientist is reduced to groping in the dark so a society that has scientists 
but don't have scholars. It doesn't have any basis upon which to experiment. And without the scientist to use and test the results of his learning, the scholar sinks into a barren pedantry. The same thing with scholar. If you have scholars, but you don't have scientists, then you, it's like you are working on water because you don't know the reli reliability and how reliable the information you are running about is. Thus, scholarship and science in the widest sense of these terms are the warp and woof of civilization. The scientist, no less than the scholar, is dependent upon the written word. Not only must he be able to use the learning of the scholar, but he must be able to record the results of his own investigations as well. Therefore, we get a string of logic. Civilization depends upon scholarship and science, and these depend upon writing. And then the civilization can only arise when the art of writing is known. Below, we will prove that Africa is the true credo of, of writing. Let's give you another distinctive figure because Africa, one, because one, why we are saying Africa is one of the early civilizations is because Africa is one of those, uh, the Africans are one of those group of people who were able to commit their, uh, commute their, um, their culture into writing. And then those, those things were also verified. So these are, and we're going to prove this to you so that you will know that there was civilization in Africa as well before you know we fell into a time of dark ages so a distinctive future another distinctive future of civilized people is that they live in cities but before people could build cities they had to master the skill of using tools made of heavy metal that's one of the reasons why we say people are civilized to live in cities and especially if when europeans got to Euro, to uh, nigeria to africa to yoruba land they were surprised that most of the Yorubas were living in cities right back in the 14th century. So, but then people who were able to live in cities, in fact, some of their cities were bigger than the cities in Europe and neater and with wide roads. And that was a mind blowing discovery for Europeans. So, that is another proof, and especially the city of Benin. There is Benin City. The Benin City was better planned than most cities in Europe. When they go to Benin City, that is uh, Edo State now in Nigeria, people were shocked. The same thing when they go to Odoyo and most Yoruba city, most Yorubas had, they had 14 cities that time. You know, more than the st number of Yoruba states that we have today. We only have six states, Yoruba states now, but those days before colonization, it were 14 cities and very small villages, I mean very few villages. So for a long time, people used tools made of wood and, and for you to live in cities, it means you have, the use of, you have to use the use of metallurgy, metallurgy and uh, metal. But, but before then, people used wood and stone. That is a sign of you know, lack of civilization. But when you begin to use metal and you're able to develop metal and iron, that leads you to civilization. Thus, the melting of iron created the basis for the emergence of civilization. And this is one of the things that really surprised Europeans when they got to Africa. You saw the, you see the bronze of the face, the human face bronze of Ife and of Bini. And those were proofs of civilization because how could you make this from a primitive culture? So they understood metal, they understood iron. The data available today indicate that Central Africa was the site of the beginning of, I of the Iron Age. Yes, especially the, uh, you know, Sudan and all that. Professor Alexander Chamberlain, 1865 to 1914, who received the first doctorate in the world in the field of anthropology in the United States, knows that the melting of iron was first discovered by African blacks. And then from Egypt, and Asia Minor, this art penetrated into Europe and other parts of the world, you see. So we discovered the use of metal, metal even before Europe. Then Professor Franz Boas, 1858 to 1942, 
an American anthropologist, was firmly convinced of the primary primacy of Africa in the production of iron items. And he argued that I, uh, neither ancient Europe or, or ancient Western Asia nor ancient China knew iron. Everything indicates that it came from Africa. Facts of trade by blacksmiths are found throughout Africa, from north to south, from east to west, thanks to their simple bellows and the fire of charcoal, they, they melted pure metal from iron ore found in many parts of the continent and forged extremely useful and beautiful items. In the Journal of the Royal Institute of Anthropology, volume, uh, that is, uh, is it, anyway, the Hungarian anthropologist Emil Tode, 1875 to 1931, points to an iron tool found wedged in the masonry of the great Egyptian pyramid. Similarly, the ancient Greek historian Herodotus uh, claims that iron tools were used by the ancient Egyptians in the construction of the green of the Great Pyramid, and these Egyptians were black. This was before the emerged before the takeover of the Arab uh, people and Europeans of Egypt. All right, so Egypt was black at this point. Thus, we have proved that according to the key elements of civilization, Africa is the site of the first civilization. Okay, I will stop here because my time is up, and we will continue tomorrow. Um, we'll continue tomorrow, but before then, please go and share this message. Share, 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 share this message. And when you finish sharing the message, you might want to join our mentorship program as well. So go to slash mentorship If you want to come to our history makers training, just write to hmt at godembassy.org, or you could go to slash hmt If to get to read my books, you could read them for free. If you go to Kindle Unlimited, uh, if you are registered there, or you could buy them on Amazon. Otherwise, you might want to write to my office by writing to dssbooks at gmail.com. That will be cheaper for you than to buy even from Amazon. And um, please share the message. Share, share, share. And we'll be glad to continue this topic tomorrow. But there will be video today. Just after this now, I'm going to show a video. Yeah. Uh, so see you and watch the video and let's learn more about African civilization. Blessings. Welcome to Candid Africa. Truthful and unapologetic. The first Europeans to be civilized by the Africans were the Greeks. When you heard of Homer, the first European to have written anything, you couldn't miss that. They said that Homer wrote the Iliad and the Odyssey. And that was not until 833 BC. The Africans had already in 255,000 at the Tassili Mountain, they had the civilian period, first, second and third, the pre-dynastic period, all the way up. The Africans had produced men like this, in Hotep, the multi-genius that designed the step pyramid of Sakaya, the first man to be a physician that even Hippocrates, the so-called father of medicine, is giving him credit and calling the god of medicine. The Greeks changed his name from in Hotep to Escalapius. There he is. There he is. This gets into what you're saying. So wait a minute, you guys are telling me now that black men taught Homer and as a matter of fact, to Egypt to school. As a matter of fact, the Egyptians said Homer was Egyptian, not uh, Greek. That's right. It's only the, 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 the Europeans said that the Westerners now said he was. But let let us go back. Remember that Sa Homer himself said in the Odyssey what that the god Zeus and Apollo, Europe's first gods, came from Ethiopia. Go read it, in, and I didn't write it. it, it he wrote it. Thales, from Thales down to Socrates, and Socrates down to Aristotle, which they call the pre-Socratian philosophers and the post-Socratian philosophers, each and every one, including Plato, who spent 15 years in Egypt receiving their education. You're saying Plato was educated in Egypt? 15 years! See, what Before you, what all you have of them, every one of them. What you'd have me believe then also, it's, so part of what you said last night is that Pla Plato and these guys, went back home and they were big guys but they were taught in egypt is that what you they, they said? came there for, they the came for the education and they said it they didn't hide it they it's the modern writers the modern 
instructors and professors who are trying to deny it. Uh, let me, let me you, you can't have in a racist you. school in Birmingham non-racist education. Let me get to something you said last night that's not going to make you very popular in this town and may not allow you to get safely out of town. You told an audience last night that you saw, I think, in a tomb in Egypt. Yeah. You saw it with your own two eyes, right? Yes. You told me that Moses, there were more than Ten Commandments, Moses just took 42. The negative confessions. Long, Moses isn't supposed to have been born until 1349 B.C. The Africans were already in the 18th dynastic period. Akhenaten, who died before Moses was born, and uh, Enotep, who, who died more than 2,000 years before the birth of Moses, and others at the Grand Lodge of Mem had 42 laws called now the negative confession, one for each gnome. They go like this, I have not killed man nor woman. I have not spoken ill of the gods. Moses is supposed to be born in Egypt, they said, at a place called Succoth. Already, um, it says that Moses get the Ten Commandments of Mount Sinai. If Mount Sinai is still in Africa, right? The Sinai Peninsula is a part of Egypt. More so, is it possible for Moses to be born in Egypt, educated in Egypt, at age 85, he's still in Egypt, and he did not learn the negative confessions. Is it possible for you to go to school, born in the United States, go to kindergarten, uh, uh, elementary, junior high school, high school, and college, and never heard of the United States Constitution? Then it would have been possible, impossible for Moses when everybody had to read the negative confession five times a day for Moses not to have seen those 42 laws and extracted 10 of, the, 10 of them, leave 32 more. Now, if you could, get, you could go to the temple of Setaiwan at Abydos, to go to the, the, the tomb of Ramesses the sixth at the Valley of the Kings, go to the temple of Edfu, where you would, by the way, see the story of an immaculate conception and a virgin birth, 4,100 years before the Mary and Jesus story. Uh, as a matter of fact, wait. No, no let, me this, this, this let, me, let me just put it in the form of a question then. I mean, I don't want to stop this, because we're here for information. But what you're trying to get me to believe is that Moses didn't get the Ten Commandments from Mount Sinai, but he got them from his fellow Africans. Moses was a high priest in Egypt, Egypt. a high priest of the Egyptians in Egypt. Then what was he teaching? He wasn't a high priest of the Jews. There were no Jews in those days. They called themselves. They were, remember now, there was no, no Israel yet. Israel is not until it, um, 1196. And when we to hear of Abraham, Avram as he was called, coming into Egypt, the, Egypt, the Africans are already in Egypt, already in their 14th dynastic period when he shows up. All of the pyramids are built. That's another thing. Everyone, the 62 pyramids in Egypt were built before the first Jew was born. Why was he fleeing from the Pharaoh? Let me ask what you was the charge? I can write that? anything when I want to write, you know. Who's going to stop me from writing if I got the power? I was about to ask you, what kind of trouble do you get into? holding these kind of views? Oh, up some, the other day, I was, a black sister spat in my face and because she couldn't take that. To, she couldn't take that Jesus was black. She said, no, no, no. I mean, he had no color. If he didn't have no color, how John the Baptist saw him to baptize him? Do you realize that you're getting at the foundation? That you, you were, you were shooting and digging away at the foundation of what most of us grew up believing? Yeah, well, we believe a lot of things for a long time. One thing, they give us three pages in the Bible. Slave, obey your master. And that's what we believe for the longest time. They said that Jesus said, so how would Jesus, who fought the system, say to the slave, obey your master? It didn't sound rational, would it? So, look, most of the things, we're in, we're in a European system. You could come to this university and spend four years, go back and spend another two for your, for your masters, and another one or two for your doctorate, and never had any course at all about Africans. But every day you come here, you got courses about Europeans. This is an extension of European culture, European belief, European racism. And it, is, it has no intent of teaching about the Africans. The Africans built the Europeans' first university, the University of Salamanca in Spain. These are historical records. They just, it's just like... Hey, one, one of the things you said last night is that it's not just black people who are saying these things. No. Most of this information are written by white and white books. It's just that they don't emphasize it in the classroom. As a matter of fact, let me back you up when you open up the, the uh, discourse. We were speaking about Columbus. 
None of them in here, none of the listening audience, even in the air, has the faintest idea that in the life of Columbus, when after his death, his family had to go to court because charges was raised, and this is in the record, in the Vatican, in the secret archives of the Vatican, that Columbus was shown a map of where the Queen of Sheba that Dr. Ben spoke about. This black woman who had made it with, uh, with Solomon and produced the son, Manic the first, and they lived more than 900 years before the birth of Jesus, had already sailed through what we now call the Strait of Gibraltar, came to lands to the west, that was longer than Africa and Europe combined. And that brother is North, South, and Central America. May, may I add this? You, right here at this university, they teach, and I've just been here a few days, right? A day. They teach in this institution because it's the same as Cornell and where that Hippocrates was the father of medicine. It's not until 333 BC. Let me read this for you. Okay, you teach at Cornell, is that? I teach at Cornell also. They let you teach this kind of stuff at Cornell? They, they teach it now, I'm there. Okay. Uh, <laughs> 1700, in 1700 BC, that's 1400 years before Hippocrates, you can find the, the, the Cahoon Medical Papyrus, Papyrus of Paper, okay. uh, a compendium of information about women's diseases and pregnancies. In 1600 BC, that's 1300 years before Hippocrates, the Edward C. Smith Papyrus, a comparative surgical text and anatomical inquiry, it especially deals with the spinal colon. 1550, let me jump to one here. The, 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 um, Ebers Papyrus, a medical, there is the whole book in it, a medical paper by Queen Hatshepsut, the first known queen in history, an uh, Egyptian queen, a papyrus designed to show women how to develop a method to stop pregnancy, to insert into the vagina, made of the shrub of acacia and honey, which break down into lactic acid. Not only that. Monsanto, wait, 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 so, so we're talking about birth control? Birth control in 1550 B.C. by the Africans. It's a long time before the pill. A few days before but, the pill. But keep in mind, keep in mind, keep in mind, however, all it, keep in mind that Europe is not yet in history. The European, European is, history is not yet. yet. All I ask, one at a time. All right. Okay. Go ahead. The civilization I'm began. Homer, I'm not written his alien analysis. And, and the hero. Okay, all the stuff that you're oh. saying, you're saying we can find this. Oh, I, look, I'm nothing say if it's not here, it's either in Doc's library or mine at, back in New York. Nothing we take for granted. What the books that we brought down? And you're saying they're not all written by black men? No, no. no, no, no Anacalypsis Anna 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 is written, okay. look now. Okay. Anacalypsis is a two-volume work by Sir Godfrey Higgins, written in 1838 in England and published by Watson Company. The Golden Bow is a 13-volume book by Sir James Frazier published simultaneously in the United States and England, and it was published in 1938. Bible myths and the parallels in other religions written by Thomas W. Downs and is published in 1887 by Watson Company, London, England. The um, Ruins of Empire by Kong C. F. Volney is published, there it is, it's published in 1792 by, by simultaneously in England and France, done by uh, a man who was Napoleon, with Napoleon de Bonaparte. Uh, um, let, me, let me just say this about that. If we just give you the benefit of doubt and consider what you're saying to be true, I mean, you are chipping away at everything we've ever been taught, most of the, we, what we believe. But you were taught it as slaves. Nobody. Slave in three pieces? Yes. We are no longer physical slaves, but we are mental slaves. And this is the worst form of slavery. Some of us believe that the Cadillac and the house on the beach makes us free. But it's the mind that makes us free. Well, I'm just glad I have to ask the questions. You don't have to send any of this. Did you like or hate what you heard? Let us know in the comments below.